morning's scripture reading is from Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. It can be found on page 550 in your pew Bible. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Here ends the reading, the word of God, for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Friends, will you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my lips, may the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. Amen. I'm going to begin today's sermon with a quote. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired, signifies, in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and not clothed. You might ask yourself, what kind of hippie peacenik wrote that? And the answer is five-star general, supreme commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force in Europe, and two-term Republican president, Dwight D. Eisenhower, who many on this wreath served under. He said this during his first term as president and as commander-in-chief of the U.S. military during the Korean War. It was early in his president and after the death of Joseph Stalin when he saw the possibility of de-escalating the Cold War. He went on to say, this world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. Sadly, the Cold War did deepen during his administration and he felt it necessary to warn us once again during his farewell speech of the dangers of the military industrial complex and even referenced today's scripture about swords and plowshares. Because you see, dreams of peace don't just belong to prophets and activists. They also belong to generals and veterans. After all, they are all too familiar with the cost of war. Every decent human being wants peace. The politics of war, the when, the where, the how of it might be subject to political disagreements. But the dream of peace should never be a partisan issue. We should all be filled with Isaiah's great vision of swords to plowshares, of dismantling the weapons of war and applying them to the abundance of the land. Peace isn't easy, though. It has to be nurtured and guarded. And it's a hard, complicated world out there. Rarely are we in control of the situation. In fact, back in the time of Isaiah, war was seen as a kind of force of nature, uh, something unstoppable and That's devastating, sound. similar to a plague or a drought. Don't give them a ball. Prophets like Isaiah blamed these tragedies, including war, as a punishment for injustice, decadence, and idolatry. And in chapter 1, before today's passage, Isaiah warns Israel, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove your evil deeds from my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. According to Isaiah, it was greed and inequality that made God remove his protection from Israel and afflict them with war. 
Now, while Isaiah is a major prophet and I am just a humble parish minister, I'm going to be so bold as to disagree. I do not believe that the God of love, the God shown in Jesus Christ, a God that would forgive his enemies on the cross, would send wars as punishment, creating innocent refugees and killing children for the sins of society. No, I don't believe God is the source of war any more than I believe the coronavirus is a punishment from above. God does not afflict the innocent to punish the guilty. Still, Isaiah speaks the truth when he says that inequality, lack of justice, greed, and corruption are the precursors to war. Too many of our conflicts are driven by imperial ambition for countries to gain advantage over one another or expand their power. There are efforts to control resources, to control human beings. And Isaiah powerfully expresses God's will in a way that only a prophet could do when he declared that God's plan, God's will, is not war and punishment, but swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. God's will for our world is one that is liberated from war, where the instruments of violence are transformed into the tools of sustenance. This is a dream that is shared by many faiths. Just last weekend, the Belmont Religious Council and the Belmont Commission for Human Rights sponsored a prayer vigil for peace on the town lawn. It included a local Amman from Wayland that serves many Muslims who live here in Belmont. And it also included uh, the rabbi of Bethel Temple Center here in Belmont, Rabbi Jonathan Krauss. The two of them offered prayers together for peace for Israel and Palestine. Town clergy and other leaders in the town prayed for the many places in the world that are torn by violence. As a faithful group of Catholics, Mormons, Jews, Muslims, Unitarians, Baha'i, and Protestants all held the light of peace in their hands. It was beautiful and needed at this time. Because sometimes all we have to offer is our prayers and our light. I'm a person of faith and I believe in the power of prayer. But I also know prayer is not magic. Nobody there was under the illusion that our gathering would solve the problems in the Middle East or soften Putin's heart or bring an end to 60 years of conflict in Colombia. In many ways, we feel just as helpless as the ancients who saw war as divine punishment from above. But we do have some agency, and it begins with these expressions of peace and unity. But it doesn't end there. Peace is more than the absence of conflict. It is the presence of justice. It is the fruit of good laws and public trust. It is healthy institutions and a functioning democracy. Peace takes work, and the work of peace is right there in the words of Isaiah. Cease from doing evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Plead the case of the widow. Rescue the orphan. Build a more just, a more free society. But let us also be humble and recognize our limits. Because none of us are in control of world history or complex international relations, not even generals and presidents like Dwight Eisenhower. The New Testament has a phrase that it uses often. So often as it depends on you, live in peace and harmony with all. So often as it depends on you. We aren't always in control. Sometimes we find ourselves in times of war and conflict. Sometimes we have to decide how to best love our neighbor in the messy moment. I respect those who, for reasons of faith, like our Mennonite brothers and sisters, who object to military service. And I also respect those who choose to take up arms when they do it to defend their neighbor and protect their country. The great commandment to love God and love your neighbor as yourself, that is both a simple and an infinitely complex commandment. 
pacifism and military service can both be compatible with a theology of sacrificial love. And people of faith can disagree about international relations. But the will of God is well known. It has been spoken by the prophets of old and repeated in every generation. Love your neighbor. Pray for your enemies. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Commit yourself to justice. Insofar as it depends on you, live in peace and harmony with all. And never stop dreaming of peace, of beating swords into plowshares and walking in the light of the Lord. Thanks be to God, and amen.